it's getting very clear now that uh, in neuroscience that uh, uh, the brain has a lot of uh, let's let's call it unconscious activity uh, and, and it dominates actually what goes on in the brain most of the sugar consumption as you said is uh, if I understand correctly, due to the unconscious part. And, and if you focus on a conscious uh, activity, it, it adds relatively little to energy consumption and it uses a small part of the brain after all. So there is this 99% to, to me, unknown activities in my brain. What I'm curious about is, what, 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 how do you, both, to both of you, how, how um, how much, how much into that unknown can humans get? Uh, either by training as, uh, let's say, artists or dancers or, or I mean, performing, or uh, how far did Joyce and Proust get into the unknown world, or meditation, yoga, if you want? Or are we still just scratching on the surface of that? I mean. Is it possible? This is probably very hard to answer, but I think it's a very interesting issue. Can we get a, or psychotherapy for that, according to Freud, which I think has been more or less condemned now, but he had a point with the unconscious. Do we have any ability to make that conscious, which is in the dark energy or be hidden in the unknown realm of the brain? Yeah, I think the adult, he suppresses a lot of this. Uh, and focus on one thing, it's constituted on only one, one thing at the same time. So uh, there's a strong inhibition from the foreground. The child is much more, uh, has much uh, more activity. The child is actually conscious about many things, but not so deeply conscious about uh, one thing. So actually the child should be, if you want to study this, you should study children. really most important question about how artists create because they're tapping into this. So what you're mentioning here is exactly what art as well, I think. And in the case of Jacqueline, it's really interesting to see that he was tapping on this 99% for all his life. And when you look at his creation from the beginning to the end, he goes back to this kind of um, dark inner chamber where he had his visions and things that he used when he was a child and he taps into. So it's a uh, good answer to your question. Can I <coughs> connect to that because it's also what I'm interested in. It's often when we talk about art we come and, and talk about creativity we come back to the idea of play. So what you're saying about the child, that the, the child is less inhibited, is that also connected to, to the idea of play? Yeah, to some extent, yes. Because that's also something that we could sort of bring up, is the sort of how do you, how do you keep discovering and how do, you, how, how do you have to use this playfulness as an adult in order to, to come up with, with new solutions or come up with, formulate new problems, is, is the, the idea of play. And, hopefully, and sort of keeping a very open mind rather than sort of being socially shut down. Mm. Yeah. Because you can be curious and not be playing. So I want to learn. May I ask you, you mentioned this inner monologue or that sort of inner activity that, that you did not see in reptiles. If, if I understood correctly. And, and would you would you relate this to consciousness, this inner activity and that then you would say that reptiles do not have any consciousness at all and, and where does it appear? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, actually the uh, the reptiles I, I don't regard them as conscious. For example, when a snake is uh, catching a, a rat, uh, he, he can use his vision, he can see the rat, but then he kills the rat and then he uh, smells the rat, uh, feeds the rat to swallow it. But if you just saw him, the rat doesn't know what, what, what to do because there's no combination of uh, his senses. Uh, uh, we but know that we are not the same. <laughs> yeah, this is small children or in some way, but, but we can combine, for example, a cat is conscious, 
cat, for example, knows that the rat has disappeared through a hole in the wall. The, the, the snake doesn't know that. Uh, so, uh, he, uh, so the cat and the dog uh, is in conscious at some level, but for example, they cannot recognize themselves in the mirror. And then we have to go to chimps or elephants. Elephants are smart, so they can recognize themselves. So you mean a snake needs to have a movement of the rat? Yes, yeah, and as a frog, if he sees the, the flies, he doesn't know what to do. So is it, he, as a rat, as loves it and sees it, he doesn't have to put on the smell and the side. Yeah, he has to put a sort of program. He cannot combine his senses. So I, I, I regard the reptiles, uh, I don't think they are uh, conscious. So you can eat fish and uh, frogs, but not higher animals. <laughs> if you believe in consciousness. Conrad. Sharon Netwin from MIT uh, traveled with frogs in a cold box in his lectures. And he made a very nice experiment, which I think alludes to something we may be doing wrong when we ask questions now about other things and so He let the frogs look at a black point, yeah, which should be a fly, and he would not react. And the moment it moved, he could jump out. And I think there is a truth in it uh, of two very different things which happen in our brains as well, at least two different. Namely, that we at the one side try to associate, as we do with dark energies or with all kinds of terms, whatever the meaning is, and that we pay attention to what, where there is some change. And the others took in philosophy and the being and the becoming, and it is all known a very long time, but still we continue to uh, try to satisfy our curiosity by the one association. If I may criticize the dark energy picture, we couldn't go into physics, but there are some paradoxes. At the beginning, before you come to the dark energy, it can very well happen that in 10 years, the cosmology has again changed as it changed the 10 years before. So we shouldn't satisfy ourselves with associative pictures. And now the question to you is, uh, since also you have only uh, identified as the most fundamental problem, things like playfulness, Things like no, I, I, I was not in agreement with Bell about truthfulness. But how playfulness <laughs> create you will agree. I'm not saying they're playing. Okay, so we debate no. our terms. <laughs> uh, now, okay, I don't want to get into the semiotics of it. Uh, definitely we do things when new things arise. And definitely we do things different from how we satisfy our questions about how artists create or how the mind works. Uh, we satisfy somehow with a term like dark or like hidden. And isn't that enough uh, as a proof that we ask the wrong question? <laughs> Taking the frog, for example. Well, of course, it's, it's always too simple <laughs> and words are never enough to render the complexity of the world we're living in, but we need to have some images, I'm sorry, to explain a little bit of what we feel about things. So I um, need to uh, refer to words like this inner chamber and things like that, because it's like a treasure chamber, chamber that Jack and Lee had. So um, I'm just mentioning this not as what he's written about, but what uh, it looks like from a distance. And I'm absolutely conscious that it's very limited and I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question about dreams. I know we only can touch the topic on dreams. Um, dreams can correlate always to the consciousness or unconsciousness. Uh, the topics of the dreams, if you think of the, all the dream interpreters, is it all hocus pocus or is it some truth in it? Dreams are something, and once again, you know, I'm not talking about this, I'm not talking like, I'm not here to speak for him, but uh, I was asked to 
to see this from the perspective of Japanese art. We have a wonderful work of art in the Bar Museum here that you should all know, which is the cage. And the cage is a kind of dream. It's in the surrealist room of the Bar Museum. And this kind of dream is something that is floating. It's why Takamili teaches. It's floating vision, some things that you cannot exactly identify. And there is nothing more challenging than trying to put into a um, specific form something that is formless, which is exactly what he tried to do. And the dreams that he experimented when he was young, and that he talked about, because we had these letters, and then he explored the, uh, how to make the dreams visible when he was in the serious movement, and then he had those dreams. He tried to uh, blur the, the limit between consciousness and awakeness and dreams because it was um, really more interesting or more um, as far as somebody who's so visual. I mean it's like how you will um, <coughs> make things appear in front of your eyes and try to create them for somebody else to see. Because the problems with dreams is that we experience them Ourselves, which is exactly contrary to the idea of all, which is sharing with others and vision. So, but I think dreams, there are so many thoughts and ideas, and some are wrong and some are correct, but certainly, uh, I mean, there's some of them that have dreams, and they claim to have discovered the most painful ones. So, so there we would have uh, our community, and it's got the substance which stimulates the heart. And, and he, uh, he had a dream, and then he forgot the dream. Uh, so the next time we had the same dream, so he went to the laboratory very early in the morning, and he had uh, uh, still as he still remembered the dream, and made this experiment. I'd, I'd like to, to hear your comments on, on the mechanics of the mind, which, which we have talked a lot about here. And the reason I'd like to ask specifically is during the, the dialogue I had with Pat and, and <coughs> as a biochemist, I, I am certain that our mind can be explained or, or the mechanism of it is solely biochemical reactions. I, that's, that's the way I look upon the world. And to me, that's very natural and it's nothing strange. But I, I realize that, that it can be quite controversial to say this, and, and many people would react because that would also give a mechanism that, that we would not have a free will, we just have the illusion of a free will. And I saw that, that or I heard, that none of you actually talked about the free will today. And, and I was wondering if you'd like to comment upon the mechanism of of the mind in molecular. So certainly, I, I believe in a relativistic approach. Yeah. Uh, I mean, everything can be reduced. Uh, but the other thing is, which uh, Trandell uh, has pointed out, uh, actually, what you are thinking of uh, affects the brain. So, uh, if you are in a good school or whatever, in a good environment, uh, you uh, reorganize the uh, nervous circuits so you make the good decisions. So you uh, do practice. So the uh, uh, free will that has also been explored quite a lot by uh, this this old this uh, uh, and actually it looks like uh, uh, you seem to move a finger, for example, before uh, you are thinking of it. So uh, in some way, uh, a lot of movement, a lot of things are we are doing not due to not due to free will, which means we are just at the same. No, <laughs> because we have, a, I mean, it's a complicated, we have so many choices, nevertheless, we cannot, uh, at least we think so. And what I think is intriguing, which I didn't have time to talk about, is the social brain, the uh, mirror neurons, I think the social brain, that's the most uh, important uh, now, uh, that we, we are connected, uh, and which is, uh, 
<laughs> you, you usually we have uh, we say that we have about uh, we talk about numbers and numbers of about 150 persons we have close connection to. We can remember the names and we know them. So uh, uh, departments or uh, uh, office or a company should uh, there should be more than 150 people. We usually have face contacts with people, 150 people. Uh, and I think this is very intriguing how the neurons and how you uh, recognize faces uh, and how you can uh, connect with other people. Uh, other people. I have a question to I, you. I have an answer about free will. Oh. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> species that use all their DNA and like the puffer fish for example and it stopped evolving nothing happened for thousands and millions of years it's all the same and I'm wondering in the brain and, and what, what you're describing okay so it's only one percent that we can observe uh, um, as meaningful activity what about our ability to evolve as, as uh, you know human beings as, as a species uh, um, maybe that is where a lot of this reserve is being hidden. What, what do you think is... I, just, um, I want to add something. I read an article in Newsweek or whatever um, saying that we're seeing a new brain coming to our internet. So what do you think of this evolution of the brain? Yeah, we, we must first remember that we have only about 22,000 genes before we had 100,000 genes. And actually, the most primitive uh, animals, they have also about 10,000 so that might mean if we have trillions or hundred billions of neurons and trillions of synapses, we don't have, cannot program all, all the neural circuits. And actually, we are fairly similar to the chimps, Nyantia, 8.5% of the DNA is about the same. So, so what I think happened, uh, uh, or some theories, that was some mutation uh, a couple of million years ago. So the uh, cortex or the uh, forebrain expanded and that made it possible for us to um, uh, handle symbols and language. I think this uh, handling of language is absolutely crucial for, for the uh, evolution and development. But do you think you know, uh, that we can yeah, integrate, yeah, yeah. Well, integrate uh, the... Uh, the exactly. I guess it's a little like uh, uh, writing. I, I mean, speaking seems to be kind of, we talk about language instinct, everyone speaks, but Writing, that's something cultural. We had to learn uh, write, to, to write, and not be, or reading and writing, and not to have dyslexia. So uh, because this is not natural. I guess internet will in some way be integrated in the same way in the brain that you are to handle internet, etc. That's my guess, speculation. <laughs> No, no, I, I, I think it can uh, change the uh, genome. The question is if it's inherited, and then we come into Lamarck, but Lamarck is now uh, uh, the is, uh, uh, for decades or uh, 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 we have uh, we did believe in Lamarck, but in some way there seems to be transgenerational but, but I think most of all, it's the cultural heritage that we have integrated into that in our brain. One comment? Okay, let's have a very sound specialist on this team. Yeah. Like Cleodrog and Ingeborg. Cleodrog, Ingeborg, and then Honda. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'd like you to speculate on. Um, I like it. that there was something you mentioned in, in your talk, and it was the, the it was the aspect of, of brain and time. And I thought you you were too quick on it actually, because it's an extremely interesting thing. 
uh, how time is relative and uh, I, I know someone talked about the life of a snail at one time and it, it's, everything is so slow, all the processes are so slow in a snail and it moves so slow so it actually never notices everything that is happening around it. And also I'm wor I, <coughs> I've been working with patients with bipolar disorder and they are really interesting because when they are in the manic state they complain because everyone is so slow. They, everyone is so slow, they never follow them, they never understand what they wanted to say, like, you know, really because, uh, yeah, so it's like their concept of time is really, really different. And then they get the depression instead, the same people, and they're the opposite then. Then they are the slow ones. And, uh, and what about the time in children? How, how are they, are they uh, more kind of slow or fast? in their perception of time, and also, what about Giacometian time? You, you said he was, as I understood, he was in, into those ideas. What was his, actually, his ideas about time, and how did he want to uh, show that in his work? The, the shy lives in the present time, much more than the other, more. And is it faster or slower than the present time? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's faster. My, my personal view is that when, when I was a child, uh, time was very slow. It was boring, nothing happened. But today, I mean, the children are uh, transported from uh, uh, the music lessons to tennis lessons to uh, uh, whatever. I mean, they're full of. Uh, activities uh, completely different when I grew up. I think we were just waiting for things to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my subjective uh, view. I don't know what is good or bad. Uh, question of time with Giacometti is absolutely central to his art, so I can't answer you in like two words. There are two things. One that I've alluded to and that I'm trying to have Hugo answer on, which is the, um, the feeling of the passing of time. That is when you have the uh, awareness of every tiny little moment. It's like you take um, a, a movie and you look at it and you have all these stills. And this passing of time, like looking at you, you know, he would be looking at somebody and he would see it living that is going towards decay. So it was very creepy also because he saw the skull and how everything is in time, caught in time. So this is something that he tried to um, make visible in the sculpture and the uh, painting as well. So this is this idea of time that is passing and, and you can't stop it. And it's good in a way because it's um, it's because uh, time is passing that we're alive. So this is how death and life are melded together. And the other thing is to be able the, 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 the way you see time is something he could act upon, which is a very complex idea that you you can. It's like I, I made this uh, reproduced in the book this uh, circle that he drew, he tried to make visible this feeling he had that he could stand and just like, like you, today you rewind something on your video recorder, you can go back. So you have the control all the time. So this idea that you can see suddenly, you can go back to moments in your life that you had and really live them. So you're not stuck into a different moment of time, which is very peculiar and I'm not very familiar with, with any other artists so far. So if you push it to the end, it's also the possibility of freeing yourself from the present, the past, and then you can go into the future as well. So this is where he is very much linked to uh, other people who thought about the fourth dimension, the possibility of getting out of the experience, the experience you have limited in time. So this, these are two ways. 
But apart from the future bit, it sounds very much like Bergson's The Cone. Yeah, sure, sure. The future part is something that's pretty obvious, I think. Yeah, but it's also the artistic, it's, I, it's also probably the artistic license to speculate and, and to kind of, to invent other... It's not speculation, it's, um, I mean, it's difficult to explain it in like, like in, in five minutes, but it's when you, you, you project yourself, you, you, you're part of a story that is going. And it's like a line, you see, you just drawing the circle, and it's like you, you know everything from before and after, so you're only part of a process. Yeah, because you have a vision of how you want to affect the world and how you want to change no, the world. No, because he didn't want to change the world at all. No, but he wants to change. He wants. He wants his uh, uh, how his his image of the world to be to affect other people because that's how he sees other people. He wants. You know, it's the dialogue because it's also that coming back to. The, the, the dialogue with Predrag that we had is also the, the how, how the individual is linked to a community and, and also being part of, and obviously <coughs> it's, it's, part of, it's part of that, no? it's part of... I would like to bring up a point which apparently Elias and Per has discussed a lot and you expressed it clearly, your strong belief that uh, we will explain these things like the mind in chemistry sooner or later. I will give you three arguments. Well, I didn't say that we will, I think that is you hope. That, that we should understand it is another point. Yeah, okay. So, so I, I would like to give three, three arguments that uh, puzzles me in our uh, enormous optimism about the reductionistic approach. And, and the first one is, of course, that chemistry, as we use this, is a mixture of, uh, of describing reality and with a lot of symbols and, and um, uh, abstract language, which are also interpretations of reality. So, I mean, we, we, we don't capture the totality of chemistry. Even the chemistry in our textbooks and the chemistry we learn has been filtered through our mind. So maybe we need another dimension of chemistry before we can approach um, phenomena. The, the chemistry we have today is like Newtonian physics, simple and beautiful. And, and maybe, uh, maybe the real chemistry out there is, uh, is ugly and not at all simple as, as Ulf Danielson put it recently in one of the What is Life lecture. So that's argument one. Chemistry may be a perfect tool for describing structures of sugar molecules or salts and, and many simple chemical reactions, but there has been very little done, even in the labs, about complex chemical chain reactions uh, and networks of chemical reactions, and we don't know how they behave. The second one, the second argument I would say is that uh, natural science and reductionism maybe by definition, has been extremely impotent in, a, a, in, in any way handling complex phenomena. And there are famous things in physics like the three-body problem, etc. And of course my hope out of that is that we need to invent uh, new tools in mathematics, physics and chemistry, as I just alluded to. to it. But I, I'm not satisfied or convinced that we should be satisfied with the tools we have today. I, I think the biology, or the mind issue for that matter, the hard problem should be a drive for chemistry, physics and mathematics in this uh, century to, in, to invent new tools. Uh, it has been the opposite until now. And my third point is that, which is a more humanistic point of view, is, is that there are things in our language, like I don't know what I should call them, I cannot define them, but love, uh, love, uh, maybe hatred, mind, which has uh, got their definition through our uh, meme evolution. And it seems that they are, not, they are not scientific terms at all, I mean, either you define them scientifically, I haven't heard your definition of mind today, 
Either you define them scientifically and then you immediately do the same as we do with chemistry. You lose some features of the object. You, but of course, by defining them clearly, you can sort of work your way through the problem. But, but many of these things in our, which have evolved as memes in our language and where we have a common sense feeling about, we don't have strong definitions for them, sharp definitions. I mean, another one which I have addressed a lot is life, of course. There is no definition of life. What is life, you know? So, so I, th I wonder if there is a character in these things which, uh, which we should handle in, with, with more respect or handle in a different way. And maybe some of the problems when we discuss them is in fact the confusion around lack of definition or that we mean different things with mind. Three points. The shortcomings of chemistry, the shortcomings of natural science to, to address complexity, and special <coughs> concepts in our language which we use which are not um, accessible to science directly. I would be very happy to comment on this, but first, <laughs> no, 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 I think the, the problem is that uh, uh, you are so, uh, we, we are, uh, do, uh, are mainly focused on the genome and DNA research and polymorphism and uh, looking for, uh, and try to explain the behaviors, but uh, I think that uh, isn't very successful. And I think with uh, functional MR, for example, uh, and the more sophisticated biophysical methods, that's a much better approach, although we will not uh, solve the problem. But for example, uh, uh, there are several papers on autism in nature showing various different types of autism, uh, but uh, it's gene changes. But I, I, I mean, they, uh, I don't think they explain autism at all, while uh, maybe some of these, uh, if we can really have a look on, on the brain with the new methods, but it's, the methods are not yet. They must be improved because we, uh, uh, we can only see changes. Uh, uh, we must be able to see, look on the, 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 the individual new uh, nerve cells. We can't do that yet uh, in the human. Language. I, I was about to comment upon it, if I may. 